We have assembled ourselves together for the most solemn phase of our worship service, the Lord's Table. We now have the opportunity of recognizing the communion service is having greater impact on our spiritual lives than ever before. Communion is a test of our love for God, which is the key to why communion was ordained in the first place. This is so that we might recognize that everything was accomplished by the integrity of God in eternity past, taking our Lord in hypostatic union to the cross. Communion is our test of our love for God, listed in 1 John 4.19. We love because he first loved us. This is the concept, by the way, of reciprocity. Therefore, it is the ultimate in communion service when we reach the point of occupation with Christ. The communion service is a test of concentration under the filling of God the Holy Spirit, who is our mentor and our teacher. The ritual is very important, for ritual without reality is meaningless. The bread represents our Lord in hypostatic union and the integrity that came from his unique spiritual life that took him to the cross in which we have the proto protocol. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and was seated at the right hand of God the Father. The bread represents the uniqueness of our Lord Jesus Christ. The cup represents the work of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Beyond that, it represents our post-salvation spiritual life which describes the blessings that come to us. As David said, my cup runneth over. The ritual of eating and drinking is the principle of salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. So we relate communion to who and what our Lord Jesus Christ is and what he did at the cross. Also, there's an emphasis on the rebound technique. 1 John 1, 9. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. Therefore, there's a warning given to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in which if you do not rebound or name your sins before partaking of the elements, you are under liability for divine discipline in three categories, warning, intensive, and dying discipline. Therefore, the principle, whom the Lord loves, the Lord disciplines. God has mandated that all church-age believers observe the communion, the only ritual still in existence in the post-canon period of the church age. That's why in 1 Corinthians 11.24 it says, Keep on doing this in memory of me. This is a way to remember our Lord, a test of our concentration always, and a test for something greater, and that is our love for God. In preparation, therefore, in order to take this examination, a few moments of silent prayer, giving you the option of to name your sins to God if necessary. Therefore, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we are grateful that in eternity past you know all about us. You knew about our successes and our failures, and you understood and knew us long before we've ever existed. Therefore, we have the opportunity to learn about you and to learn about all the work of Christ on the cross and what it means to our eternal status. May God the Holy Spirit give us the concentration necessary to meditate upon these things as we are mandated to do as part of our worship service. We ask these things in the name of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, even Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Now I'll have uh, Brad pass out the bread. And uh, it is our custom to retain the bread until all have been served. And so now Dallas will sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior. And life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strong. 
strangely dim, and the light of his glory and grace. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his bruise we are drawn together. For all we are like sheep and have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord made a very solemn and important statement. He said, This represents my body, which was given as a substitute for you. Our Lord also said, Take this bread and eat it. So take all of you and eat. We are grateful, Heavenly Father, for remembering you through the cup. We pray that God the Holy Spirit will make this very real to us. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. It is our custom to retain the cup until all have been served. We have not been redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from our empty manner of life, but by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord took the cup, saying, This represents the new covenant of my blood. Drink ye all of it. Uh, and we will all now sing, Let Us Survey the Wondrous Cross, or When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. So please stand as we sing. Nature. 
amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my Father, we thank you for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich for our sakes, he became poor, that uh, ye through his poverty might become rich. We pray this in the name of the King of kings and Lord of lords, even Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. We're still on the subject of child abuse, so turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18, verse 7. Matthew chapter 18, verse 7. Verse 7. Now recently I've bumped up my studies quite a bit. And, uh, well, there's going to be some things on the internet. Actually, it's going to be a marriage special. If you've looked at the website, you'll see on there a little thing that says marriage special. And uh, if you want to listen on your own free time, go ahead and click on that. And I'll go ahead and do that on the internet. It's not going to be live. And the reason why is simple. If I were to put on the marquee in front of the house up there that uh, we were having marriage special Monday through Friday and twice on Sunday, oh, the congregation would swell and we would get all types of different people in here. Not that it's bad to have uh, people come in and receive the gospel, but uh, this ministry is directed toward those who are serious. And you cannot... uh, when people are subject oriented when they think that uh, they need doctrine to solve their marriage well it's true doctrine will solve the problems in marriage but you can't latch on to just one and then when the doctrine of divine decrees is taught you slip out so um, if the congregation were larger and if there was a demand I would go ahead and do it live but uh, I'll just uh, put it on the internet since I uh, if, if I don't do if I don't uh, keep busy like that I feel lazy so uh, that's why I'm doing it, and uh, and therefore uh, the doctrine of marriage, very important doctrine, and it will be detailed, and uh, it'll start out pretty basic, uh, with the basic things such as starting out with attraction, moving to compatibility, and then moving on to rapport, uh, and we'll study in detail the the whole realm of marriage and how it relates and if you want to get it it'll be on the internet and I'll make uh, copies on mp3 if your internet connection isn't too uh, good so now we're on Matthew chapter 18 verse 7 Matthew 18 verse 7 and uh, we need to get some introductory principles of Matthew 18 7 first of all point one child abuse is the abuse of power when you are a uh, parent you have power over your children and therefore when you abuse your children you are abusing your power child abuse is related to power lust and it's related to the power lust of the old sin nature and uh, some of you may say well there's been a sexual uh, type activity isn't it a sexual lust well that's related to it but it's really all related to power power over the child and it's a lust uh, for example um, Rapist, uh, if you ever talk to anyone who studies rapists, they say they don't rape because uh, they like the uh, sex, and they don't rape uh, because uh, that fulfills them sexually. They rape because of power lust, and therefore uh, some ideas have come forward in which, well, why don't we just neuter the rapist? Guess what? They would still rape because they like the power. It has nothing to do with the... Uh, really their sexual appetite that's just a side that's just a a side point to them and it's really to have control to abuse power point two parents have power over helpless children and can easily get away with misuse and tyranny and there's a lot of child abuse that is unseen today in the world and in this country especially and uh, a lot of parents get away with it and that's because of the intimate relationship between child and parent. Point three, child abusers have a powerful compulsion in the lust pattern of the sin nature. Child abusers have a powerful compulsion in the lust pattern of the sin nature. It's a powerful lust that opens the door to the entire lust pattern in the soul. And so someone who is a, who is a child abuser it is very rare that they stop what they're doing. 
usually they continue all their life until they drop dead and are buried in the sea as our Lord says they will be. There have been very few reformed cases of child abusers. And if a child abuser has reformed himself, it's because of salvation first, and then post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation, in which they're re rehabilitated by the Word of God. And it's happened, but it happens rarely. In most cases, these people are helpless, hopeless cases in which they will continue in their child abuse. And there's been some studies where a child abuser has been in jail and they're about to set him free and the man says, don't set me free. I know as soon as I get out I'm going to do the same thing. And he's warned them. They let him out anyway and he goes out and does the same thing. And our laws do not uh, uh, deal with these people harshly enough. And some of them even recognize their situation of their lust pattern. And they even recognize that they're so uh, filled with scar tissue they just won't stop what they've done in the past. So it's a powerful compulsion. Abusers of children have been, usually, this is a principle, uh, abusers of children, I think that's point five, abusers of children have been abused themselves in many cases by their own parents. It's usually a self-perpetuating system in which the uh, child has been abused, the child grows up using defense mechanisms, and then they too abuse their children or children in their periphery. Point six, and this is important, well, point five again, Abusers of children have been abused themselves in many cases by their own parents. No, that's not. Well, point four. Well, let's go through this again. Point one, child abuse is the abuse of power. Point two, parents have power over helpless children and can easily get away with misuse or tyranny. Point three, child abusers have a powerful compulsion in the lust pattern of the sin nature. A powerful lust opens the door for the entire lust pattern. Point four, the powerful compulsion in child abusers, this is the one I missed, the powerful compulsion in child abusers is to repeat the circumstances of their own childhood. There's a strong cruelty factor where there should be love, thoughtfulness, and, sense, and a sense of responsibility. In other words, uh, where there is a strong cruelty factor, there should otherwise uh, be love, thoughtfulness, and a sense of responsibility. The child abuser has none of those, almost incapable of loving. Point five, abusers of children have been abused themselves in many cases by their own parents. Point six, and this is an important point because there's no excuse for it. Point six, however, there is no heredity in child abuse. It's not something you inherit. And there's always discussions on uh, what has been inherited. And some people like to say homosexuality was inherited through a gene. Well, we all have a gene called the old sin nature. And you might have a trend toward homosexuality, and oftentimes that is brought out by child abuse, but it's never an excuse and uh, therefore you cannot blame heredity. There is no heredity in child abuse. But the reason people begin to wonder, there must be heredity because this person was a child abuser, his son was a child abuser, his, and his grandson was a child abuser. Well, it's not heredity, they're just imitating their authority figures. So there is no heredity in child abuse as it uh, might seem that way on the surface. I'll admit it does seem that way, but there's no link in heredity. It has to do with uh, volitional decisions from one generation to the next. That's where we get the four-generation curse. By the way, we're under that today. It's sad to me, and uh, today is September 11th, and September 11th was a sad day to me. It's a sad day to me today. And I uh, watched some of the things on the news today, not on the news, I don't have cable, but on the computer where I can download some uh, snippets and watched a lot of that. And all of it really tears me up because it, uh, it shows me our country's in serious, serious trouble. So it is a function of the sin nature in which the old sin nature passes on trauma from one generation to the next. This is prevalent in our culture. And I would probably be correct in saying most children have experienced some type of abuse, whether it be emotional or sexual. And that is definitely the case because uh, parents, Christian parents, haven't gotten with the spiritual life. Therefore, they don't know how to rear their children. 
And the, and the, you say, well, you don't have children. How do you know anything about this? Well, it's the Word of God. And the Apostle Paul was never married, yet he said more wonderful things about marriage than anyone on the face of the earth ever has. It deals with the Word of God, and that's, experience is not the criteria. A lot of people have experience, and they're terrible at their jobs. You could be experienced in your job and be completely worthless and terrible and then somebody will hire you based on your experience and then they'll wish they hired the other dude who didn't have experience so that uh, at least he had humility so he could learn how to do the job and would do it right once he got in his niche. Experience is just way overrated. Way overrated. And if you have the knowledge from the Word of God, it gives it to you very clearly how to raise children, you'll do all right at it if you uh, apply the principles. Now point seven Child abuse is the passing down of a traumatic past from one generation to the next generation. Child abuse is the passing down of a traumatic or child abuse is the passing down of a traumatic past from one generation to the next generation. And this has been definitely occurring in our country. So let's take a look at Matthew chapter 18 verse 7. Woe to the world this is a corrected translation. I didn't bother to look at the King James or any of the others. Woe to the world because of child abuse. For it is inevitable that child abuse cases occur. But woe to that person through whom the child abuse comes. Again, the corrected translation. Woe to the world because of child abuse. For it is inevitable that child abuse cases occur. But woe to that person through whom the child abuse comes. So the first sentence in this verse deals with the evil of child abuse. Our Lord actually, uh, in teaching the disciples, he suddenly pulls out uh, a child as a reference point and starts talking about child abuse, which shows its importance and the fact that it was occurring then and it will occur all through history. The first sentence in this verse deals with the evil of child abuse. The second sentence is the condemnation of child abusers, and they receive a harsh condemnation. So we have the Greek word skandalon. That's S-K-A-N-D-A-L-O-N. Skandalon. It should sound familiar to, to you. It's like scandal. Skandalon. S-K-A-N-D-A-L-O-N. And this means to trap someone who is innocent. Our English word scandal has uh, pretty much the same connotation uh, if you trap someone who is innocent. The innocent child is trapped by the evil lust patterns of siblings in child abuse or their parents. And uh, they are trapped in this by those who are responsible for protecting the child. So they really have no defense except the defense mechanisms because those responsible for uh, protecting the child are the ones who abuse the child. This is scandalon. There are certain judgments that occur in human history that apparently have no explanation. And this judgment could come from a natural disaster or military defeat. And you remember not too long ago, in what last Christmas, I believe, uh, the, or just the day after Christmas, uh, a huge tidal wave hit uh, the degenerate areas in, in Southeast Asia. And many of these people were involved in child abuse. They would sell them into the sex market. And even after the big wave crushed them all and sent them to hell, many of the people took the children who were orphaned and uh, sold them into the sex trade. But especially in Indonesia. That's where one of our former presidents liked to go a lot. I wonder why. It's none of my business. I was judging. Forgive me, Father. But uh, what we have, and that's not really how you rebound, but I'm just playing. But what we have here is the fact that when uh, a whole cult culture is involved in child abuse, there will be divine judgment. And the judgment can come in the form of a natural disaster or military feat, defeat. Anything that brings people into great shock as they are destroyed. Our country has been shocked quite a bit lately, hasn't it? Some of this might be related to the four-generation curse and the fact that there is so much child abuse prevalent today even in our civilized society. And we are definitely moving quickly through the five cycles. 
Uh, we're definitely through number one, the shock of terrorism. Number two is economic collapse. Well, uh, things are heading in that direction. We just have to wait and see on that. But it's moving quickly. A divine discipline after divine discipline. Then everyone wants to blame the president. No president of any superpower can stop the wrath of God when he wants to punish. And it's not the president's fault. It's the Christian's fault. It's the Christian's fault. That shocks a lot of people. What do you mean it's the Christian's fault? Because they won't get with the Word of God. That's why. They're too busy with other things. And um, Friday I gave the eight stages of reversionism. And uh, it'll be a good message to hear because I delineated the difference between the defense mechanisms and the eight stages of reversionism. And that's because some of these defense mechanisms uh, that I listed in terms of the first ten versus the uh, first ten of the defense mechanisms, uh, I told you that was for the abused, and that's true. But if you remain outside of fellowship long enough, if you remain in reversionism long enough, even though you've never been abused, you'll start to develop defense mechanisms because you're going to go psychotic. So again, I'll, I'll give you the listing of the defense mechanisms, then the eight stages of reversionisms, and we'll have a, a short comparison and contrast before we move on. First of all, rebound. That's the first problem-solving device. Instead of rebound, uh, the person who uses the defense mechanisms utilizes self-justification and self-deception. And uh, I gave out some handouts. I might have some extras up here. I'm not sure if you didn't receive one. If you didn't receive one, I'll give you mine and make some more. Who's missing one? You need one? All right, I'll give it to you in a second. So there's a rebound, and then on the other side, self-justification and self-deception. Instead of rebound, you justify yourself. Instead of rebound, you deceive yourself into believing you're always right. If you're always right, you don't need to rebound, because rebound is admitting to God that you've sinned. And you don't do that when you use the defense mechanisms. Then, number two, the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. That is the power of the unique spiritual life. And instead of that, you are self-absorbed. You are filled with yourself, not filled with the Spirit. And therefore, you could even rebound. And you could uh, suddenly shock yourself because you've just committed a sin you thought you would never commit. You've shocked yourself, so you name that sin to God, but as soon as you do so, you go into bitterness again toward the abuser or anyone else. Therefore, you're self-absorbed, and you go right back out of fellowship. And so uh, there's really no benefit to being in fellowship for two seconds if you're going to fall right back into bitterness. This is the problem, by the way, in marriage that we'll study a lot. Uh, self-justification, self self-deception, and self-absorption will destroy a marriage because uh, the person who is always bitter justifies it. I have a right to be bitter. My husband is a jerk or my wife is an idiot, etc. So you justify your bitterness. You justify your feelings of hatred, your feelings of sometimes arrogant superiority over your spouse. So you justify what you do. If you're a lady, you justify not respecting your husband because your husband's a jerk. But we seen, we saw from 1 Peter chapter 3, it's not an excuse. And then under self-deception, you're always right no matter what. And therefore, and this happens a lot with abusers, abu people who have been abused, not abusers, but people who have been abused. And when they get into marriage, oftentimes they can't handle it whatsoever unless they have post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. They can't handle marriage because it brings in similar stress, stressors that they had in childhood and they immediately grab onto the, the defense mechanisms. Instead of using rebound, they justify themselves. Instead of being filled with God the Holy Spirit, they're filled with themselves and filled with bitterness. Instead of using the faith rest drill, now this is for the abused person only at the start. Remember, the child has no other way to solve their problems but to use the defense mechanisms. If you've never been abused as a child, the defense mechanisms remain buried. And then when you become an adult, uh, when times get bad, even if you're in reversionism, you're not going to repress it and you're not going to dissociate from it unless you've stayed in reversionism so long, outside of fellowship for so long that you've gone nuts. And when you go nuts is when you start to bring out the defense mechanisms. But the, 
the abused child has a handicap because this uh, type of neurosis and psychosis comes out immediately. As soon as they're abused, the defense mechanisms go to work and therefore when they carry it into adulthood, a psychosis and neurosis, neurosis shows up immediately. While for the person who's never been abused, if they go into reversionism, it takes years to develop psychosis. But they will, and they too will eventually use the defense mechanisms. So there is a difference, and it's a, a fine line that uh, must be drawn for us to understand that it, these uh, defense mechanisms can also apply to those who have never been abused, but have been in reversionism so long that this is what they actually do. So instead of the faith rest drill, the abused child uh, uses the defense mechanisms, take, pulls it into their adulthood, and they have repression and dissociation. They forget about the abuse, or they dissociate themselves from the abuse by developing split personalities, which is the oddest thing I've ever seen, but it happens. And some people have developed 10, 20, 30 different personalities, hard to distinguish which one uh, they're using. But under a certain circumstance, instead of using the faith rest drill, they just switch their personality. If things get very stressful, sometimes if they're a lady, I've seen this, they switch to the man personality in which they even lower their voices and try to take command of the situation. And then at other times, when uh, times get rough, they switch personalities to the baby type talk and, and start talking like a baby and a completely different person. You can't even hardly recognize who it is. Who are you? You're about ten different people, and that's the way you've handled all the problems in all your life. And so repression and dissociation. Then we have grace orientation. And grace orientation is important for us to get to a point where we understand that everyone is a sinner, everyone is depraved, and therefore it staves off self-righteousness and projection. So on the other hand, self-righteousness and projection. Then we have doctrinal orientation. And instead of doctrinal orientation, you haven't been taking in the Word of God, you're using defense mechanisms, and so you go to a psychologist and get human viewpoint orientation. That's number five on the other side. Number six, a personal sense of destiny. And then uh, when you reach a personal sense of destiny, it means you've developed per, uh, spiritual self-esteem. But on the other hand, instead of spiritual self-esteem, which is totally uh, related to humility, you have human self-esteem, which is totally related to arrogance. And in that self-esteem, uh, in trying to build up this uh, human self-esteem, you're always looking for approbation lust or approval lust from others. And if you go to a place where you don't get the right amount of approval lust, uh, you, you won't hang around long. Uh, everyone, you must have the attention of everyone. You must be the center of attention. You must be well liked and well treated, etc. And uh, this part of it, the human self-esteem, is lack of objectivity, lack of humility. You'll never be able to learn. You'll be so far absorbed with yourself. You'll any doctrinal principle will step on your toes and you just won't accept it and you'll never uh, grow up but that's your choice remember the abused person has a choice some people have been abused and gone the full route of their spiritual life some have been abused and fail miserably but then, but then again uh, so goes life many of us may have never been abused but some of us win in life and some of us fail in life it's all a matter of volition the decisions we make in life dictate the life that we lead then we move on to personal love for God the Father. Personal love for God the Father. What happens with the abused uh, child often is since they've been abused by parents or siblings, they look for a human idol and they develop personal love for a human idol. Maybe their human idol is grandma or grandpa because grandma and grandpa have been nice to them and never abused them. Or maybe they make a human idol out of an aunt, a relative, or a friend. A lot of them make human idols out of their friends. That's where we get a lot of gang activity. Their uh, parents let them down. That's where they had faith perception. So now instead of, uh, they need to have a sense of belonging, so they go and they join a gang. And that gang becomes their family. By the way, Hillary Clinton, it takes a family, not a village. The village is messed up. The family brings stability. 
So personal love for God the Father is on the one hand, but on the other hand, you develop personal love for human idols and then you destroy them once you see their feet of clay. You see uh, grandma or grandpa's feet of clay. They get angry with you one day and you probably deserved it. And then you uh, relegate them to the position of abuser just like your parents were the abuser. So you destroy the human idols you create. That's called iconoclastic arrogance. That's something all of us can have, by the way. But it's definitely an offshoot of the defense mechanisms. Then we have impersonal love for all mankind. And on the other hand, impersonal hate for all mankind. And what happens in this stage is that you have went all out for approval lust. You've wanted the approval of a whole bunch of people. And then later in life, all of these people whom you have made idols out of have let you down and you've been hurt and destroyed over and over again. And you get married and get divorced because you're hurt in the marriage. Of course you're going to be hurt in marriage. Insults are always exchanged in marriage. That's why it's so hard for an abused person to ever succeed in marriage because as soon as they get married, uh, the man or the woman uh, does something wrong and immediately there is a strong reaction and it's time to jump out of the marriage over something simple even. That's why divorce is rampant today in our country. There's no, they're, they're very hypersensitive. Part of that had to do with their abuse. And they uh, take the husband and lower him to the level of the abuser. How, are, how in the world are you going to have a sexual rela relationship with someone in marriage when uh, they think of you as the abuser? And that they transfer, they project onto you the uh, the same attitude they have toward the abuser so it eventually uh, because they're let down so much so much in life they begin to have impersonal hate for mankind and it doesn't depend on the person it depends on them and it's because they are so full of hatred and bitterness they simply go ahead and uh, rule out all of mankind as being against them and that's where we hear a lot of psychotics running around saying the whole world's against me the whole world's trying to destroy me and it's not true, but they've developed an impersonal hate for all mankind instead of impersonal love. And uh, a lot of them become hermits later in life and they avoid all types of uh, social contact. They avoid marriage after trying it several times. And they avoid uh, any type of relationships for fear of being hurt. And they'll be hurt in relationships, all of us are. But they have, they're using the defense mechanisms and it just hasn't worked out too well for them. So they eventuate in having impersonal hate for all mankind. And at some point they end up uh, usually in a loony bin uh, where they have to be medicated. Then we move to plus H, sharing the happiness of God. Plus H, sharing the happiness of God. And when you reach that as a believer, it means that no one can take away your happiness. No circumstance can take away your happiness. Doesn't matter if you go broke. Doesn't matter if uh, even if uh, your marriage is falling apart because of the other person. If you have plus H, uh, you continue in happiness. Because remember, God was happy in eternity past. He'll be happy in eternity future. He's happy today, and he's happy despite the fact that all of us probably sin today. And he's happy today despite the fact that uh, all of us are idiots. And the Lord Jesus Christ was happy on the cross despite the fact he was receiving the greatest uh, judgment and fierce pain ever experienced. Yet he had exhibited happiness. That's a tremendous power that's available to us. On the other hand, you have plus M, sharing the misery of the abuser, which we studied in detail on Friday, that deals with the fact that you share the misery of the abuser because of the transfer of the millstone. And if you haven't heard that, it's on the internet and it'll uh, maybe we'll get some out here sometime so people can uh, get caught up when they need to. Then, of course, occupation with Christ. We've studied that, so we won't go into that. And this is how we've related the uh, 10 problem-solving devices versus the 10 defense mechanisms. And some of these aren't really defense mechanisms, they're just offshoots of it. For example, self-justification, self-deception, and self-absorption, you can have that without using the defense mechanisms. Therefore, but if you do have the defense mechanisms, you will use that. It's inevitable. If you don't have the defense mechanisms, you may use that. You may not. And so what we have for simple carnality, not related to child abuse, are, are the eight stages of reversionism. And they go as follows. Reaction and distraction is number one. 
reaction and distraction. That's reaction to the Word of God. You got your toes stepped on and reacted to it. Or distraction. There's too many other things that are more important in your life. It's the first stage of reversionism. And uh, that should uh, scare some people because uh, if you're distracted from the Word of God, you're a reversionist, period. You're going backwards. If you miss one day of Bible class and you don't get it any other way in terms of listening on the Internet or getting a tape, I understand some of you listen to other doctrinal pastors, and that's fine as long as you're getting the doctrine. As far as I'm concerned, I have nothing, nothing against it. I mean, there are some biblical principles involved in which there's a danger in which you can become what is called in the Bible a spiritual whore. But uh, if you have enough sense to know what's right and in terms of doctrine, then uh, I really see no uh, problem with it uh, myself. And, and as far as I'm concerned, I know there are other doctrinal pastors out there, but I always listen to the colonel. I, I've listened to others... Uh, just to, just out of curiosity to see if uh, they got it straight, etc. And I've heard uh, Bobby a couple times, not often, uh, but usually I just stick with the pastor I had because just as we all have a right woman and a right man, we all have a right pastor. And I might not be everyone's right pastor here today. I'll be the first to admit that. And uh, if you're getting it elsewhere, at least you're getting it. But reaction and distraction, if you're distracted from the Word of God and you just don't get it, one day, I can't remember the last time I missed a day. It's uh, I don't, I just, it's been years. If I even have in years, uh, but if you miss learning the Word of God one day, you are in reversionism for that day. You have just, uh, that's the first stage of it, reaction and distraction. And then the second stage is a frantic search for happiness. And oftentimes, what happens is when you're distracted from the Word that Mateote starts to function and uh, instead of having stability you go all out in a frantic search for happiness and uh, it could be in several different ways uh, one of the oddest ways that I see is people go in a frantic search for happiness by becoming the greatest legalist ever I guess they like the attention because they use the holy language God bless you brother etc and they receive pats on the back and everybody looks at them as spiritual that's their frantic search for happiness then others go out um, in a frantic search for happiness by raising hell all over Anderson or all over the country just raising hell and that's a frantic search for happiness and uh, it seems like lately every morning uh, I wake up and I hear Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and first, when you first wake up and you're groggy, you think, well, are we being attacked? What in the world? And then the car will pass by. And then here comes another one. <laughs> what is that? I guess they call it music today. Well, these, it must, and it's, some of them are in a frantic search for happiness, obviously, but you're not going to find it from that. You'll go deaf. I, I, just, I don't understand. I, I've never understood my own generation, but it's getting crazy. A frantic search for happiness. And that's music. Go figure. Then Operation Boomerang. And that's when you, uh, you're seeking happiness. You go all out for happiness. And instead of the boomerang hitting happiness, it comes back and smacks you on the forehead. And you end up even more miserable than you were before. So you're going out looking for happiness. Uh, you go out to parties and get drunk and do drugs and the boomerang comes back and smacks you on the head and you have a hangover and all the other things and you wake up more miserable than when you started. Frantic search for happiness and, and that eventuates in Operation Boomerang. Then when that occurs, if that doesn't wake you up to the importance of the Word of God, you go into emotional revolt of the soul. This is where a lot of people go into the Pentecostal movement, but you don't have to do that to have emotional revolt of the soul. You simply let your emotions take over uh, the reins, as it says in the Bible. You let the emotions take over your thinking. Thinking is the stability of life. Some people don't like to think because it takes a lot of work. 
the hardest jobs I've ever had were not labor, physical labor jobs. They were jobs that involved thinking. Some jobs in, involve both physical labor and thinking. I guess that would be the worst. But uh, in, in terms of thinking, thinking will drain you much faster than uh, working in the hot sun. In fact, uh, working in the hot sun and breaking a sweat, especially for a man, and uh, going home and taking a shower is probably one of the most... Uh, invigorating things ever it's sometimes it's fun I mean the, the work might not be too fun but once the day's over you're gonna have a good night's sleep like you've never had it before but if you have a job where you have to think uh, you might wake up in the middle of the night thinking and it's just uh, it's a different type of work and thinking is work and if you're adverse to thinking and if you're adverse to learning things because it takes a lot of mental uh, concentration, you'll eventually have emotional revolt of the soul. And that's because you've let your emotions take over. Your emotions are your God. We must have the thinking of Christ, not the emotion of Christ. We're never commanded to have the emotion of Christ. We're commanded to have the thinking of Christ. Your Bible say the mind, but it's not a noun, it's a verb. The thinking of Christ. Then we move into locked in negative volition. Locked in negative volition. And it's locked in so long as uh, you do not uh, rebound. It's locked in so long as you haven't gotten to a point in which you've been punished so badly that uh, now uh, you'll rebound. Locked in means uh, you're just not even going to think about doctrine. Uh, you can be distracted for a couple days and then say, well, I'm going back to it now. I've been out of line. Or uh, you could just uh, have reacted to it the whole time and then finally uh, get to the point of locked in negative volition. No matter what you hear, you're just not going to believe it or you don't even care to hear it. You're completely distracted. And then what occurs then is blackout of the soul. And that's where you've forgotten everything you've ever learned you might have learned rebound, but if you stay in reversionism long enough, you'll get to a point where, you're, where, where you will forget rebound. And there's been some cases where people have not only forgotten rebound, but they've forgotten that they were saved. And they go into Buddhism or something else. They've completely forgotten everything that they've ever learned. Blackout of the soul. Number seven is scar tissue of the soul. Once all the doctrine is blacked out, then comes the scar tissue. Because Mataiotes opens up in your stream of consciousness and you suck in every false doctrine ever created, every human viewpoint, every satanic idea out there, and you develop scar tissue on the soul. If you stay in that phase long enough, you'll develop so much scar tissue, you'll go past the point of no return. Like an airplane in World War II, if they went on a bombing raid, they only had a certain amount of miles they could go in which they could turn around and make it back safely. But if they kept going past the point of no return, they're going to crash. And once you get past, uh, once you have enough scar tissue on the soul, you crash and burn. And uh, that's why... And, uh, sometimes I, I don't laugh, it's really sad, but uh, some people have been on up in their 80s and people are still trying to give them doctrine when they have rejected it their whole lives. That just, uh, it's not going to work. There's too much scar tissue. And if they've rejected, now there, there have been cases of uh, bedside conversions in which they were unbelievers and then believed when they were 80 and then got a little doctrine before they died. That's happened before. But when they're already saved and they've been in reversionism for some 50 years, it would be a joke to try to get them on it. They've passed the point of no return. There's no hope, none whatsoever. So the best time to really get on doctrine is when you're young and that is when you can really move forward because if you wait, uh, if you're a believer and you wait until you're uh, too old, well, maybe you'll go positive at age 50 and you've always been negative, you're going to have a lot to overcome and it's going to take a lot of time. And while you're sitting there still struggling with a, a certain basic doctrines, not you, but people who have, uh, they might struggle with eternal security for three years before they get it straight in their heads because they've had so much scar tissue that they have to push out. And that definitely occurs. But there is a point of no return. And then number eight is reverse process reversionism. That's where you just simply go right back through all of these things all over again. 
You reverse it, and then you continue to build scar tissue on scar tissue. Your soul continues to be blacked out. You continue to have locked in negative volition. You continue to have emotional revolt of the soul. You continue to operate under Operation Boomerang, in which divine discipline keeps smacking you on the head, and you don't care, and you keep going as a stubborn, stiff necked person. And then you continue with your frantic search for happiness. And some people develop all sorts of things wander lust. They think they have to live in all 50 states and just wander all over the place uh, thinking they'll find happiness here or there or anywhere and they don't and then of course reaction and distraction they continue to either react to the word of God or be distracted from the word of God both are very closely related so with your heads bowed and your eyes closed Father we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the word may we come to understand from this the importance of the word of God and on this September 11th, uh, may we receive uh, more fire in our bones for the Word of God because it only takes a few to turn around the, a, a nation that is in degeneracy. Just as Moses um, was allowed to preserve two million people, so our impact is even greater, and we understand that, and we understand the importance of growing in grace and in knowledge on a consistent daily basis. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.